Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum. We are delighted that you can join us today wherever you are uh, in the world. Um, just a few reminders before we get started. Uh, there's a chat box to the right of your screen, and we would love for you just to sign your name and just where you're located. And uh, we'll be using that same chat box later in the presentation uh, for questions and answers that you may have. So before we get started, I would of course like to open us up in a word of prayer. So let's bow our heads. Your Heavenly Father, what an honor it is uh, today uh, to just come together, just to have access to this technology, uh, to uh, just have uh, so much uh, global support in Samaritan's Purse initiatives. And Lord, we're just honored today to talk about the history and really focus on you. Lord, uh, you have blessed this organization and we give you the glory. I just uh, thank you for Ken Isaacs and I thank you for Dr. Furman being with us. And it's in your name we pray, amen. So I'm just really delighted today. We're gonna be talking about development of emergency response medicine at Samaritan's Purse. And I'll tell you, there's two gentlemen that I have the utmost respect for. Uh, welcome to the show this, uh, today. Thank you. All right, so we have uh, Ken Isaacs, uh, Vice President of Programs and Government Relations here at Samaritan's Purse. And of course, Dr. Richard Furman, who's the co-founder of World Medical Mission. So again, gentlemen, I'm just delighted to have you guys today. And so we'll go ahead and get things started. Ken, I'll ask you if you would start us off. Thank you, Lance. It's good to be here today. And I wanna thank all of you for uh, joining in with us. We're gonna take a, a bit of a walk down memory lane and it's not just to reminisce, but it's really to see what the important uh, learning uh, points were and how we got from where we started to where we are today with emergency medical response. I'm going to go through some slides. There'll be a lot of uh, facts and, and uh, minutia in it. Uh, it may be of interest to you, but you won't be able to read it maybe today as fast as I'm going through it, but we're going to be able to send that to you and make a link available. This is an overview of our field medical responses through the year. These are the major ones. These aren't all of them, but two that I would call your attention to uh, one is in Somalia in 1992, and uh, that was the first time that we uh, deployed as an organization and uh, set up a mobile medical unit in uh, Somalia. Uh, Dr. Richard Furman was there, uh, that stick right here. <laughs> and then the second thing I would want to point out is Albania in 1999. Uh, during the Kosovo War, there were about 800,000 refugees. We built a refugee camp in Albania for the Kosovar refugees. And uh, that camp was uh, sized for 25,000 people and we had a 40 bed hospital there. So we, we figured that out. No matter what I'm talking about today or, or what I'm giving you an overview on it, I think something that I would want you to understand is that Christ is in the center of it. And it really comes down to that medicine is a powerful tool for evangelism whether it's in a mission hospital or whether it's in a crisis setting. And you'll see examples of this as we go through the uh, presentation today. Here is Somalia. Uh, I have just point out in the photograph, bottom right-hand corner, you'll see uh, Dick Furman and his brother, Jimmy. And they had just finished a long trip with the U.S. military down to a coastal town called Baidoa. And they got back late in the night and Dr. Furman may have more to share about that later, but that was a mobile medical unit, first time that we had done that. And it was really sort of uh, a situation where we figured it out as we went along. In Rwanda in 1994, it was a genocide. 800,000 people were killed. Uh, we provided primary health care up in a place called Rutari. And then when the fighting was over in July, we came down to Kigali, where you can see photographs of the hospital uh, and the state that it was in. Um, but we helped that hospital set up and we supported and really guided the uh, reestablishment of the entire Ministry of Health for a two-year period of time. In Sudan, uh, in South Sudan, during the Civil War there, uh, we went to a place called Louis, and there was a church hospital that had been closed down. We reopened that, and that was really the first time that we had worked in an active war zone. And um, it was um, uh, an interesting time. And I will point out on the top right photograph, the fellow in the white surgical cap, Dr. Richard Furman. <laughs> <clears throat> Albania and Kosovo, I mentioned the tent hospital. You can see it there on the left in the slides. And uh, on the right side is Franklin and one of our board members, uh, Mr. Brian Pauls. You guys look awfully young in those pictures. 
<laughs> Shut up. Um, we still are young. We're still young. You are. Um, in Haiti, 2010, um, the 230,000 people uh, dead, massive, massive uh, destruction, loss of life. And uh, tens of thousands of people had serious crush injuries. Uh, many doctors came down and worked with us, um, including uh, both of the gentlemen here today, uh, Dr. Plyler and Dr. Furman. Uh, we worked in mission hospitals, but it was really after Haiti that uh, we started talking about how could we have some kind of a mobile medical emergency capability that we could deploy anywhere around the world. So we tried that in the Philippines. We put together, uh, Dr. Plyler at the time was uh, leading that effort and we put together really uh, the first mobile medical hospital. We set it up, uh, we didn't, real estate is location, location, location. Our location on that deployment was in the Schistosomiasis Hospital. And uh, uh, it was a little bit low, a little bit flooded, but we had a great team. Mm. Uh, you can see their photograph there. And uh, I hope some of those team members are uh, tuning in today, but uh, we learned so much there. Mm. And uh, we took those lessons like we did the lessons from all of the other previous and the future deployments and we incorporated them and we continue to try to improve as we go along. In 2014, West Africa, Ebola, 11,000 people died. Mm. Uh, we were at Elwa Hospital and we really got into a situation where we had to decide, were we going to provide active clinical treatment to Ebola patients? It wasn't an easy decision. It wasn't an easy action, but uh, we stood up a DART team, a disaster assistance response team. We sent it uh, to Ebola and Dr. Kent Brantley in our country office there had started treating patients in the chapel of Elwa Hospital. Mm. Uh, before it was over, uh, Dr. Brantley got Ebola and so did one of our team members, Nancy Brightball, an SIM missionary. Mm. So we worked with the State Department and others and we were able to get them back to the United States. There was huge media attention. We had media camped out here at our offices 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But we learned the value of, of two things there. One was, we needed to be prepared in infectious disease and infection prevention and control and protection of our staff. And then of course, the other thing um, that we learned was the importance of, um, of, of the entire circumstance and how seriously we had to train our staff repetitively. <laughs> this is a list of emergency field hospital deployments that uh, we have made over the years. I'm not gonna go down that list right now, but it'll be there in the PowerPoint presentation. In 2016, uh, we had a real game changer. Uh, we had purchased a DC-8 that gave us the ability to move up to 40 tons for 7,500 nautical miles. And we had designed the hospital to fit in the DC-8 and to be able to uh, be delivered in one fell swoop and to be self-sustaining for eight days. So there was an earthquake in Choni, Ecuador. Uh, we went there, we had uh, permission and the invitation from the Ministry of Health as well as PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization. So um, uh, that was uh, really quite a deployment. And again, I had the, uh, the great honor of being with uh, Lance Plyler and also with uh, Dr. Richard Furman. And at this point in time, we're starting to transition. We're talking to Lance about being the director of World Medical Mission. Mm -hmm. And we're talking to this guy, Dr. Elliot mm -hmm. Tenpenny, and I've, highlighted this photograph of him here because he's not here today. And, um, but he was the one that really, he is an emergency uh, medicine doc. Mm -hmm. So his skill set coming into it uh, has been a great benefit and a yes. tool for us. In Iraq in 2016 and 2017, during the retaking of Mosul, we set up a hospital on the Nineveh Plain in a town called um, Bartella, as I recall. That's right. And um, we had the invitation of the Ministry of Health. We had the invitation of the World Health Organization. And we set it up seven miles from the war front, the active war front uh, to our west in Mosul. We treated patients, women, children, combatants, non-combatants. We had ISIS members come there and uh, we treated them all the same. We showed them the love of Christ and uh, we had over 4,000 patients and we performed more than 1,700 life-saving surgeries. This particular hospital presented extraordinary security challenges to us, and our security department 
proved itself really to be invaluable. Uh, it allowed us to get more close to the fire to offer emergency medical assistance than anything that we had ever imagined before. <clears throat> in Congo uh, 2018, we again had an Ebola response and some of the things that we learned here was the extreme importance of flexibility, the cultural challenges. Uh, there was a lot of corruption and a lot of uh, chaos in the society around us. And uh, we had to rethink the layout right there on the ground. And then we had to give uh, meticulous attention again to the dawning and the doffing. And there's a reason that I'm bringing that up and I'll talk about that in a minute. Bahamas, 2019, 2020, there was a major hurricane, Dorian, and uh, really up in Abaco and Grand Bahama, it, it did massive damage. The hospital, you can see it in that large photograph on the left is Ran Hospital. It had a wall of water come through it, six to 11 feet tall, and it was totally destroyed. And to my knowledge, it's still not open. Uh, we set the hospital up there and we provided uh, all of the health care uh, for Grand Bahama and people were flown in from the islands around the area. Uh, later, uh, we would go back to the Bahamas and uh, with COVID at the request of the, the prime minister. You can see here the list of where we have done our major uh, COVID responses in uh, 2020. And um, I'll go through some of these slides in just a moment, but we learned quite a few lessons we built our entire EFH program around the notion that we would deploy it into the third world. We didn't expect to deploy it into the first world. Right. And our experiences with infectious disease primarily came out of Ebola. So our infection prevention and control, our donning, our doffing procedures were very, very meticulous. And we came into a COVID situation, both in Cremona, Italy, and then within a month later, in New York City, and uh, we were probably more strict on the protocols than I think that we became later in time as we all began to understand more about uh, COVID. But we had to learn about licensure in the United States and Italy. We had to learn about the importance of co-location and the supply line coming from the hospital out of central supply, cleaning the linens, feeding the patients, all of these things. The local politics, having support, that was a, an important lesson in New York City. Uh, and we were able to pivot from the third world plans that we had made to first world standards. And a part of that, of course, included coming up to par on HIPAA standards. And all of a sudden, our legal department started playing a really important role in our contractual arrangements. This is Cremona, Italy. And the photo on the right, you can see the 600 bed regional hospital in the background. When we got there, the staff were overwhelmed. They were emotional. There had been thousands of deaths and they cried because somebody came to help them. And Cremona, Italy was the first place that we set up a hospital of this magnitude. I think it was about a 70 bed or 68 bed hospital. I believe it had 10 ICU units in it. And uh, one of the things that was very interesting there was that the Cremona Hospital were sending patients to us that they expected to die. Uh, they had not at that time had even one patient survive from a ventilator. And when they came over, when they sent these patients to us, they started surviving. And through a process of discussion and exploration and observation, we learned that the medical systems were different with the authority of the doctor in Italy over the nurses and the autonomy of the nurses in the ICU in the American system to respond immediately to the needs of the patient, whether they were on a ventilator or medication, whatever was going on. And so we worked with the Italians and they also then started adapting some of our uh, modalities and they had patients beginning to survive too off of ventilators. We learned in Italy and in New York that uh, tragically only about 11 or 12% of the patients who were put on vents would survive. Mm -hmm. Uh, ours was a little bit higher because our intensive care, I think, was probably more intensive. But you can see that one photograph right there where uh, we are in Central Park. It's prime real estate. It's, it's like holy ground, really, in New York City. Yeah. But uh, later, we came under um, criticism from the uh, LGBTQI plus community that we define marriage as between a genetically born man and a genetically born woman. And they wanted to say, 
that we were discriminating against gay people and that wasn't true. We've never discriminated. Right. We treat everybody equally without regard for who they are or what they do or what they believe. And, um, but we learned a valuable lesson and it was said in the paper, well, how did they get into Central Park? You know, who do they think they are? Well, we didn't just go and camp out in Central Park. We were invited by the state of New York. We were given permission by the mayor's office. We were taken to Central Park. We were shown the site right across from Mount Sinai Hospital. And they proved to be an outstanding and supportive patient even through the turmoil. But the one thing that I would wanna say is for whatever criticisms that were put into the uh, media, uh, that was not what was shown to us right. on the ground. On the ground, New Yorkers and Italians were enormously thankful that we were there. Right. Every night at seven o'clock, they would come out and bang pots and applaud and cheer us. And it would bring me personally, I was up in New York for a, a few weeks to tears and, uh, and they fed us uh, enormously, <laughs> they fed us. But yeah. we had such a great team in both locations. And I, was, I could see that we were prepared, that we had staff, that we had inventory, we had a game plan. And um, later we would get requests from the uh, central government of Sudan, from Congo, from Czech Republic, from California, from Texas, from South Carolina. And uh, th that was going on and on. Later we were in Lancaster, California and right here 40 miles from us in Boone and Lenore, North Carolina. So uh, we have grown and you can see in this slide right here in the middle is a picture of a hospital. That's the one in Central Park. And that's a nice idyllic picture to look at. But what I would want everyone to understand is each one of those white boxes are a vitally strategic component of the machine that makes that hospital in the frame possible. And if you look in the upper right hand corner, you in the blue boxes, you will see that the DART specialties, that's the non-medical and the medical are extremely important. They are really the backbone that make this possible. But everything from warehouse management, supply chain, the ongoing uh, support of the pharmaceutical supply chain, consumable supplies, security, it goes on and on. One of the valuable things too, I have to give a shout out to is the biomedical section and World Medical Mission, as well as the International Health Unit. And they have a subsection called uh, medical operations. Those are the guys that lay these tents out and lay this hospital out. Uh, so that it flows like a hospital should flow. Right now that we've grown, uh, we were using what I called a 2-2 strategy that was two major medical deployments and uh, two non-medical deployments simultaneously. Well, in 2020, we did that two times. So now we have expanded the challenges of our strategy and we're going to a 4-2 strategy. So we want to be able to deploy four major medical responses at the same time and two non-medical. This is going to mean that we need more capacity. Mm -hmm. Capacity is so important. That means we'll need additional logistics. Think larger airplane, that's in the process. Think a larger DART roster, the Disaster Assistance Response Team roster. Right now we have about 1,400 people on it and we're gonna take that to 2,900 people. And that's really why and the central point that I think that Dr. Furman and Dr. Plyler and I want to make today is to encourage all of the world medical mission doctors to use their talents and skills in a way that might be new and that they hadn't thought was possible. But this is our encouragement to you today. So uh, we're looking at this growth happening uh, over the next 18 months. It's not going to be next week. It's not going to be next month, but it does give an opportunity really to all of us to be involved in sharing Christ and helping in Jesus's name in ways that are new and that you may not have thought were possible. So, you know, I've been at Samaritan's Purse going on 34 years and it's been a great blessing in my life to see this growth, uh, but to see where God, and it is God mm -hmm. that has brought us. I, you know, I wish that I could say, oh, we were brilliant. <laughs> we sat around in a, in a room and we came up with these wonderful ideas. We didn't, we were just trying to be faithful stewards. But when I look back on the parable of the Samaritan, it sticks in my mind that that parable started with a catalytic question coming from the uh, man of the law to Jesus. Rabbi, how do I inherit eternal life? And through that, Jesus gave him the parable of the good Samaritan. So the Samaritan saw the man in the ditch. He had mercy on him. 
He went to him and then he bandaged his wounds. He put him on the donkey. He gave him logistical support. He took him to the inn and there he would have gotten shelter. He would have gotten food. He would have gotten a blanket or a robe. Scripture says that he had been left naked and for dead mm. and uh, he would have gotten water. Those are the six sectors of emergency response today. And in just a few verses, Christ described them perfectly. And at the end, his command to us is go and do likewise. So we're extending an invitation to all of you today to come and join us in helping in Jesus' name. And with that, I want to thank you. And I'm going to hand this clicker over to Dr. Richard Furman. And uh, he's going to take us down his view of what I have already said is my memories. And we're going to see if they differ. And if they do, <laughs> Dick, I'm going to tell you. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you, Ken. Yes, sir. That was awesome. Yeah. All right, Dr. Furman, uh, we'll let you go now. Thank you so much. Well, Kenny has given us uh, a good history of, of how everything has happened as far as disaster relief. I'm going to give you a little history on World Medical Mission, and but mainly how that how they intertwine, uh, how the, the two medical arms uh, parts of Samaritan's Purse has really uh, worked together for for many years and for years to come. Uh, look back 1977 when uh, my brother Lowell and I were here in uh, Boone, North Carolina, and Franklin Graham was a senior at Appalachian State. <laughs> And uh, Franklin and I had developed a friendship riding motorcycles. And uh, we were invited to, to the Billy Graham Crusade in, uh, down in Asheville. And so Lowell and I went there and they found that we were surgeons. And there was someone on the Billy Graham team who had uh, uh, a son-in-law who was a surgeon in a mission hospital in India. And he asked Lowell, he asked Lowell and I if we would go for a month each to help him out because he was so busy and just overwhelmed. So Lowell and I decided, yeah, I'd, I'd cover his night call while he was gone for that month and he'd cover mine. So we, so we went. And uh, once we got there, it, it, it was unbelievable the difference, the needs, the medical needs at a place like uh, Mission Hospital in India, that it was really overwhelming uh, to compare that to what we were doing uh, back in Boone. And I encourage everyone watching, doctors, nurses, whatever, uh, that you go on a, to a mission hospital or to a, a DART employment and it will change their lives, but it'll also change your life. And I'll never forget discussing uh, with a Hindu patient, I'd put a, a pacemaker in and he, it had saved his life. He realized it most appreciative patient I think I ever had in my, in my uh, career. But before he, before we checked him out, uh, he wanted, I wanted to know about all these Hindu gods you walk down the street there in India and there'd be hundreds of little Hindu gods along the sidewalk and ask him about that. And uh, he said, well, there's only one God in heaven. And he said, but you Christians think there's only one way to get there. And uh, we, we feel like that there are a lot of other gods uh, that can, that can get, get you to heaven. And so I asked that night, uh, I, I asked the Lord to give me a verse to give to that patient that I was going to discharge the next morning. And John 14, 6, where Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. And so I presented that to him the, the next morning. And the, the Hindu anesthesiologist, who was my interpreter, who walked out in the hall and he said, what you told him, I believe. So I, I thought mm -hmm. that was great. Wow. It's going to change my practice at home. And back in Boone, I started, and then I just tell you this because you can do this for your patients. I started talking to my lung cancer patients uh, about what they would, where they were going, what, how they were going to get to heaven. Had they ever talked about, thought about eternity? And I used that verse uh, back in, in my office. And so I just would just encourage you to, 
to, to go and then come home and let it affect you back home. Uh, after India went to the Papua New Guinea, which was the most primitive area in the world at that time. And that's where I met uh, Bob Pierce and uh, Franklin. Uh, we were there and, and Bob Pierce had started Samaritan's Purse and Franklin was on the board of Samaritan's Purse. And we had talked to him about, uh, about these mission hospitals and, and overseas ministry. And Bob Pierce is the one that told Franklin me that, that, that medicine is like a magnet that brings uh, people there that you can tell them about Christ. And it wasn't long, this was, this was there in New Guinea. And I went uh, out to this, to this village and everybody in the village came because we were physicians and we had a, we had a box of medicine. And uh, I, I realized that that's so true that medicine is like a magnet that brings uh, people there that you can tell them uh, about Christ. I thought you know, if I were a missionary, just went there to that village and stood out there, the whole village wouldn't come for several hours uh, to hear what I had to say, but they would come for medicine. Then we could tell them uh, about Christ. Uh, it wasn't long after that, uh, we, we got together uh, with, with Franklin, talked to him about starting an organization for sending doctors overseas to mission hospitals. And uh, uh, Franklin did decide, okay, he would, he would join with us to, uh, to, to start that. Uh, and that's how World Medical Mission uh, got started because of the need at these at these different hospitals and so that went on uh, we this is we Franklin and I went to Tenwick Hospital our third year and uh, uh, met Ernie Sturry who's the who's the doctor there at Tenwick he was there by himself at the time and he he brought to us uh, a letter saying that he was going to he was going to be uh, going on for one year he was going to be home on furlough but he had a letter there <clears throat> that said that his replacement wasn't going to be able to come and this we had three weeks to to try to help him out and that was a, a that was a learning experience uh, there at, <clears throat> at Tenwick where Franklin prayed with, with uh, Ernie and myself, and he asked, uh, asked God uh, to, to give us doctors uh, to replace Ernie. And I'll, I'll just never forget, I didn't, I, I, he asked uh, God that we were trusting in him to bring people. And, I, and on the way back to Nairobi, I, I told Franklin, hey, you, you, gave, you gave Ernie a false sense of hope. Mm. We only had seven doctors went out the whole year before. And now we were going to get 12 doctors starting in three weeks uh, to come replace Ernie. And uh, uh, when we got back, we had a note from Becky Williams to call Boone. And we called and she said that there was some doctor in Pennsylvania that was going to take his family uh, on a uh, trip, vacation beginning in, at the end of the month and three weeks and he just wondered if he ought to go ought to go uh, overseas to a mission hospital so that was the answer uh, our trust went from Lowell and Franklin and me uh, looking at how we're going to develop world medical mission and that that verse that uh, we're, we're trusting in you, O oh Lord, for you are saying you are our God. Our future is in your hands. And that's, that's when we realized that God was going to lead World Medical Mission to, to uh, that was the year that Bob Pierce passed away. Uh, they asked Franklin to take over at Samaritan's Purse, they brought Samaritan's Purse from California to Boone. And that's when we really started uh, really trusting that time was where we were going to trust in God for our future. 
And of course, we've gone from those seven doctors to now 700 a year. Uh, and it's, it's, it's been so good, but we had to make, we started different plans, started relying on God for where do you direct us. Uh, Lowell and I started to uh, travel every other weekend. One of us would go somewhere to talk to a group of doctors to see if they would go overseas. Uh, then we started going to different hospitals with, the, with these plans uh, to see where we can send doctors. And we were, it was really something to realize that not all mission hospitals uh, were focused on evangelism. And that's what we felt like we were called to do, is to send doctors to witness for Jesus Christ at those hospitals, to evangelize those, those hospitals. And it didn't take, as we went from one hospital to another, we went to almost uh, 15 or 20 hospitals over a month's time just to see if they were hospitals that we should send doctors to. Wouldn't be there uh, less than an hour, you'd realize whether they, where their focus was. And if they were focused on evangelism, then that's where we would, that's where we would send the doctors. And that verse uh, that talks about, and it's hard a man makes his plans, but the Lord directs his steps. And that, that's what we started doing is we started planning and see how the Lord would, would direct our steps. Uh, this was, was uh, a letter, I guess his third or fourth year, went to Kajabi uh, Hospital in, in uh, Kenya, got a letter that said, when you come, make sure you know, before you operate on somebody, make sure you know that they've been witnessed to. If they hadn't been witnessed to, wait till the next day, but get with the chaplains, get with, uh, with your, your patients and know, evangelize to them, uh, give them the plan of salvation. And that sort of opened our hearts that yes, we need to, to develop a relationship with the chaplains. We need to uh, evangelize uh, these patients. And so we started, uh, when I went to Kajabi that time, we would make, when we would make rounds, became, I guess for the first time, realizing all the doctors and nurses that are watching that are going to be going, we need to know the patient's spiritual history as well as we know their physical history. And so what we would do on the chart, I'd put a little plus or a minus. If they were uh, Christians, I'd put a little plus. If they were not, I'd put a little minus. And those are the ones we'd take the chaplains to spend time with. And that's what, uh, it was so good to talk to a chaplain one evening and the next day, look at the chart and see that minus had been changed to a plus. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, uh, that's what we want to, to zero in on today. And uh, just uh, two or three years ago, we realized the importance of the chaplain at these mission hospitals, the importance of the chaplains uh, when we go, when we have our field hospital. Doctors are busy. We can't uh, witness nearly as much time as a chaplain does. So we started, we've started a chaplaincy program uh, that we're gonna help the chaplains uh, in all of our hospitals. Uh, we've got a one year program that uh, we're gonna present to them. And uh, Hope, hopefully all of them uh, will graduate. We're already starting to hire more chaplains in these hospitals. So whether you go to a field hospital or a mission hospital, remember to become united with the chaplain. So you can tell the chaplain, this patient needs witnessing too. Uh, you, you know the, those patients' uh, spiritual history. So that's... Uh, that, that's big in what we're dealing with now in developing uh, that, that chaplain's uh, program. And it, as, as time went on, uh, it became apparent that uh, doctors were retiring from these mission hospitals and the mission organizations were not getting replacements because young doctors were getting out 
uh, getting out of their residency with the big debt. And most of them would say, well, we'll go, uh, we'll, we'll have, uh, we'll take a job, we'll pay our debts off, and then we'll get on the mission field. And we realized they weren't, that wasn't happening. They would, uh, they'd get out, they'd start a practice, they'd buy a car, they'd buy a house, and they just weren't getting, uh, getting on the field. And, and uh, Dr. Folks, Jim Folks from McKinney Hospital, I had retired many years ago and he said, you, you have to get uh, young doctors on the field. And I'll, I'll never forget uh, going in, I was in Kenny Isaac's office uh, one day and he just said out of the blue, what do you think about uh, uh, developing an internship type program for, uh, for young doctors to get out of residence? Mm -hmm. And that's, that started uh, a domino effect of, okay, how do we get, how do we do that? So we start, uh, I think the first year we had one, and now we send anywhere from 15 to 27, I think, Good a idea, year. <laughs> and, uh, but that's, that, that's, uh, that developed. Uh, what we do is we will tell a resident that we will support you for the first two years out of your residency. And that's the nice thing about World Medical Commission, we know where the needs are, whether an orthopedist, uh, family practice doctor, even uh, we have working on our third neurosurgeon right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we know where the needs are in, in these 52 different mission hospitals. Uh, so we know where to, where to send them. And that is, that's, that's growing. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I think it's 82% now are staying beyond their two year. Right. We tell them we don't, we'll help them for the two years. We expect 32 years out mm -hmm. of them. I'm gonna switch, uh, switch gears right now and tell you about the, the intertwining of the World Medical Mission, Mission Hospitals and the disaster relief response. This is a picture of uh, earthquake in Nepal. Uh, I've been with Kenny on, on many of these that he's already mentioned, uh, uh, Somalia, uh, Rwanda, uh, many, uh, many of the earthquakes. And we realize that there is an intertwining of doctors that are, go to mission hospitals to doctors that go to these field hospitals. And we're just asking you, this is uh, Elliot Tenpenny that we were talking about, Kenny was talking about earlier, uh, asking you to, to, my feel is that every rural medical mission doctor, uh, we're encouraging you uh, to register with, uh, sign up with the, uh, the emergency, the DART hospitals and vice versa, the DART hospital doctors to, to sign with the World Medical Mission. Wow. And there, there's such an intertwining, interrelationship of this that uh, we, we won't, want you to realize that our basis, as Kenny said, basis is evangelism. That can happen on the mission field. That can happen in the uh, uh, emergency uh, field hospitals. So we're asking you to do that and I brought, I brought our spring on call uh, with me just to give you an idea of how that, how that intertwines. Here we have uh, an article on a, a doctor that retired. She retired, Dr. Dr. Hack retired by, uh, over 10 years ago and she's been out with World Med uh, six or seven times, it's been with the DART uh, three times. So there is a good inner working relationship. Uh, a doctor that we just put on our World Medical Mission Committee uh, uh, list is uh, headed up the DART hospital in, in Italy. There's also going with World Medical Mission. So I'm just encouraging everyone watching to realize uh, it's all about your 
your witness to the Lord in serving. Uh, this is this is Kenny and me. Showed you that picture of the earthquake in Nepal. Uh, Lance and I were at this little village. The earthquake yeah. came, and it was uh, disastrous. Kenny came with a helicopter uh, to pick us up. We owe you one. So we'll always be indebted <laughs> uh, to Kenny, but we appreciate that. But looking back over the years, I, I remember I went to see Kenny on his first trip with well drilling wow. years and years ago. And that's why I'm excited about the future because that, that verse in Philippians 1, 6 that, that said, for I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will see it to completion. Amen. Kenny and I both are getting older chronologically and physiologically. <laughs> and but that's exciting to realize that what the future holds is going to be exciting. It's going to be exciting to see yeah. uh, what that what that is. Now, Dick, did, did, did I come and save you and Lance there with that helicopter? <laughs> I think I did, didn't I? Isn't that why I took that photo? <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure, but we, we felt like you'd save us because we didn't know how to get out of there. All the trails around were blocked off. Yeah. So we do appreciate it. We, and we will thank you forever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't see anything else. Past I'm gonna, that. <laughs> I, before Kenny interrupts again, I'm going to close <laughs> by telling you, uh, share something with you that my brother Lowell told me. He died of leukemia, uh, and he he had been had all kinds of, of honors with uh, the American College of Surgeons. He'd been governor of North Carolina chapter for for two times, been president of, of the American College of Surgeons. Anyway, all of those honors, Surgeon of the Year here in North Carolina. He sat with me. We talked one whole day. This was shortly before he died, and he said, "You know, looking back." at all of that, all of the honors and whatever, whatever we did with our surgical practice in Boone yeah. does not compare one iota with what we've done for the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just sharing that with you. All of you watching, just think of that. The day will come when we'll all look back and be able to say that. But as I've gotten older, I realize more and more that that is so true, that how we use our medical uh, expertise for the Lord, that's the real reward. And I, th I do thank uh, Kenny for being able to look back all these years and see what all we've done. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, you know, you guys, it was just a great blessing to hear both perspectives, you know, just uh, the way that we work together uh, to develop disaster response here at Samaritan's Purse with the DART team and, and World Medical Mission. And um, I'm just so glad that we were able to capture that history today from, from you gentlemen. And, uh, you know, it's such a blessing too, to be able to work together, um, developing disaster response. And Ken, one thing that you just um, really highlighted, and I just want to emphasize is that um, through the years, I've been here about 10 years, and, and it's just been miraculous to see how God has really developed um, our ability to respond in disasters and, and medical outreach. Uh, whether it be at, uh, with the disaster or a mission hospital, it's really, it's been God and we give him the glory for that. And really we're saying today uh, that we want you guys uh, out there, our, our, our medical um, team, um, if you're able uh, to go to a mission hospital, we encourage you to do that. If there's a disaster, we want you to be involved with that. We need your help. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and transition to Q&A. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, there's a chat box to the right of your screen and we're really, we would love to entertain some questions for the audience. So um, just uh, if we can, let's uh, have a question. So start off with, how does a physician apply for the DART program? The application is uh, currently not live. So Kenny? So uh, with the, we normally have a DART application online. We pulled it down right now. And the reason is because we're retooling the way that we recruit staff, the way that we place staff, and the way that we maintain contact. One of the challenges that we have is if you sign up to be on our DART roster, it could be six months or a year, a year and a half uh, before we might deploy. We're never able to predict when a disaster will happen. So we wanna come up with a meaningful and effective way 
to maintain contact with everybody and to be more careful about how we manage that roster and keep people um, engaged. And it really is an elite group of people. Uh, we might accept, uh, I won't say the percentage, but I'd say that it's probably lower than most elite universities. And um, so it, it is elite, but we wanna be careful in how we handle it and we're retooling that right now. So my expectation is that probably in the next two weeks that DART application will be back up online and you can fill it out. And it's an abbreviated application for physicians who are already signed up with World Medical Mission. It's just a little bit more information. It shouldn't take too long to do it. We'll see how that works out with the IT department. I don't know, but I know that a lot of people are uh, working on it. And, uh, but we certainly invite people to come and join us. Right, all right. Well, uh, right now we don't have any other questions. Just encourage you, um, We've got these gentlemen, this is a great opportunity. So I encourage you to reach out to us. So let me just uh, reach back out to you guys and um, ask you, uh, Ken, you've mentioned that we're gonna be growing uh, the DART program quite a bit. What subspecialist uh, would you say that we need? Well, I know that we need uh, thoracic surgeons, we need general surgeons, we need emergency uh, doctors. For every uh, doctor that we have, we need uh, eight to 10 nurses. Um, we need anesthesiologists, um, we need uh, laboratory technicians, we need pharmacists. We have a whole list of uh, different positions, but we also need non-medical. You know, you've got to have electricians, you've got to have setup people, you need to have uh, inventory people, uh, security people. It, that one photograph that I showed is not only with the hospital in the middle and all of the ancillary support, but that actually uh, takes place on the ground too. So uh, when we get the DART application back up, you can go there and see. And if you're somebody that has medical experience and that has the right personality profile, you're comfortable with going out into places and you wanna share the gospel, you wanna use your skills for the glory of Christ, uh, we will do everything that we can to try to find a, a place for you in that. All right, thank you. Um, so what do you think is the biggest hindrance uh, to people going into long-term medical missions? Dr. Furman, I'll, uh, I'll have you answer that one. Well, with, when we started the uh, post-residency program, the, the biggest uh, hindrance initially was finances. And we've pretty well helped them get through that. And like I said, 82% are staying there uh, beyond the beyond the two years, but there's a lot of things that come up. That it, it is, uh, it's so tough to stay there on a mission field. Mm -hmm. uh, they need support. Uh, a lot of our OB residents uh, were just overworked. I mean, overwhelmed 24 hours a day. There'd just be one of them that just keep on and on it. So, so they need the help uh, of. World Medical Commission doctors coming to help them, yes. things like this, but the, uh, that plus the interpersonal relationship. We're here at home, we have somebody that we don't particularly get along well with, we can uh, avoid them. You can't do that on the mission field. So that's, uh, that's the, I think that's the biggest thing to pray for the ones that are there, yes. to make them realize we're for them. Okay. All right, very good, thank you so much. Um, so here's one that I think either one of you could certainly answer. Do we need orthopedic surgeons? Well, so I'm not a doctor, I'm a well driller. <laughs> However, uh, yes, we do need orthopedic yes. surgeons. So, you know, if you look at the broad category of <clears throat> why you would set a hospital up, it's the way that I have categorized it. It's either something infectious or it's something traumatic. And uh, traumatic, bone breaks, crush injuries, piercing injuries and orthopedic surgeons do in fact uh, play a key role. I, I just wanna comment, it's something between a DART and, and mission hospitals, but the world has changed today with COVID. And uh, many of you that are watching are doctors that would typically be going to a mission hospital. And right now uh, there's travel restrictions, you know, they're talking about a, a COVID passport, uh, countries are subject to change their laws and you could find yourself stuck somewhere. All of this is unknown. It's not like it used to be. Um, and if you're in a DART situation, 
I would to challenge both groups to think about cross-pollinating your skills for the glory of exactly. Christ. Yeah. And if, if you're on a dart and, and we don't have any crisis in the world, please call us at World Medical Mission and see if there's somewhere in the world that you could go to use your skills. And what we do, and I say this not boastfully, we try to create an environment where you can use your skills without having to worry about where you're gonna sleep, what you're gonna eat, where your workload's gonna come from, or what your tools and equipment are gonna be. We try to get everything there. And whether it's in an emergency uh, crisis kind of setting or whether it's in a mission hospital, uh, Samaritan's Purse is supporting that. So if you feel called, um, please let us know. And Lance, I'll, I'll throw into that too. Uh, orthopedic surgeons, uh, that's the, the best example I can come up with. When we went to Haiti, I guess 80% of what we were doing, maybe 90% uh -huh. were orthopedic surgeons. Uh -huh. And they were, they were needed right then. Yeah. And like you say, it may, may not be another earthquake like that, that situation for another year or two years. Yeah. So that's why we would say every orthopedic surgeon on World Medical Mission needs to be ready, signed up that they can get off at, that, at a quicker time. Yeah. So we can rearrange different for the mission hospitals. We can rearrange that, but but there there's an urgent there's an urgent there's going to be an urgent need for orthopedic yeah. yes. surgeons, and we'd like to have eight or ten surgeons orthopedic surgeons signed up with DART that we're sending to mission hospitals in that year or two or whatever that we're waiting on that to yeah. happen. Yeah. But it's going to happen someday. Yes, that we'll give them a call. Yes. Yeah. But they need to have the little check. Yeah. By their name on World Medical Mission that hey I can go yeah I can go dart exactly World Medical Mission hospitals are a great place to prepare for a disaster response yeah um, so another question we have from the audience what opportunities are available uh, for EMTs PAs and medical assistants nurse practitioners and then what about medical students so that's a loaded question. Why don't you take that one? Because okay. Lance, you've been out and you know a lot about this stuff. Okay, so, um, yep. So let me um, just talk about both World Medical Mission uh, and uh, disaster response. So there are opportunities uh, if you are, first of all, if you're a, a medical student, we actually send out a lot of medical students uh, to one of our various mission hospitals around the world um, uh, to prepare. I don't believe we have a disaster <laughs> response opportunity for medical students, but we do have opportunities at our mission hospitals uh, to serve if you're a third or fourth year student. With disaster response, a lot of them um, uh, of our responses um, do require EMT. Um, some of them are very driven by, uh, let's take an example like cholera, where it's very driven by uh, fluid resuscitation and uh, very protocol driven. And so EMTs um, serve a great role there. We do take mid-levels too, uh, like PAs and nurse practitioners. So we encourage you to sign up. Um, Medical assistance, I'm not sure to be real honest with you if we have taken medical assistance or not. I'm gonna check with my friend, Dr. Elliot Tenpenny on that one and find out. I'm not sure to be honest with you, but that's a great question. And uh, we encourage you, we need a lot of medical people involved. And so. we definitely take nurse practitioners and physician's assistants. Absolutely. Um, they're, you know, they're highly valuable and uh, we, need, we need you to come. Amen. All right, great. So, um, Next question is, if you and your spouse are both medical, how easy is it to serve together? Dr. Furman, you want to take that yeah, to start I'll take, off? I'll take that one. Uh, that's, that's a good question for, for the World Medical Mission aspect. Uh, that, that's our expertise. We know uh, where the needs are. Mm -hmm. So we find out where and we've done this, find yeah. out where there's a need for a, a surgeon and right. an obstetrician or a family practice or right. whatever. But if uh, a, a team needs to go, we can find a mission hospital where such a need is. And we do this really with, uh, with the post residents too. So yeah. that's, uh, th th that's an easy find. And we have it in emergency response too. I've seen several situations where Married couples are out, um, they're medical, they're both medical or one of them has yeah. another technical specialty, an x-ray radiologist or something like that, and it works out good. So if they've got the skill sets, they're certainly welcome to come together. All right, great. All right, I think um, we probably, um, this may be our last question, but uh, next question is, can Samaritan's Purse staff in other departments be deployed on a DART? Um, and if so, how does that happen? 
Well, they can be. And as I said, uh, about 50% of our DART list is uh, non-medical. So, uh, you know, we need finance people, we need IT people, but the way to do that, if you work with Samaritan's Purse, if you're in another department, uh, you would want to uh, make an inquiry into the IDRU, the International Disaster Response Unit, which sort of manages uh, the structure of the DART. And then, but you also have to get a permission from uh, your supervisor. And uh, for those of you in Dismarriage's Purse, you know we have this little thing called like rules and policies and stuff like that. And, um, but we would welcome you to come down. And in fact, I know uh, that many people from other departments actually get assigned to come out on darts and we're very appreciative of that. Absolutely. So, all right. So I think that really concludes our Q&A time. Again, I just want to say, you guys, it's been just a lot of fun and uh, great to go down memory lane, but really just to highlight the way the Lord has worked here at Samaritan's Purse mm -hmm. in developing our medical responses. So we want to thank you guys for joining us today. I just want to remind you guys that CME credit is available for this session. The form and instructions are in, going to be in your email, which we will be sending for follow-up uh, uh, after um, this uh, presentation. There will be a link and a recording. Um, if you have not joined, I encourage you to join Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum at health.samaritanspurse.org and be the first to know about upcoming events. And just also want to say there's a, a number of archives there of previous presentations with CME links. Uh, there's hundreds of presentations that will be great to help educate you uh, in responding with us here at Samaritan's Purse. I just want to remind you that our next presentation is May the 12th with uh, Dr. Bruce Steffies, who has incredible field experience, and he's going to be discussing burnout and humanitarian work. So really just encourage you guys to join us uh, May the 12th uh, at 12 uh, p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. So with that, I think we're going to conclude. You guys, thank you again for just being with us today. Just uh, it was a real honor to have you, Dr. Furman, uh, Ken Isaacs. And so we thank you. And until next time, uh, God bless and take care. Thank you, Lance. All right. Thank, thank you, Lance. You. All right.